Thank you for coming out to the new school tonight on a fairly nice, uh, what seems like a summer evening, but is actually a fall evening, to participate in this public conversation on democracy and question socialism and liberalism in the age of Trump. My name is Jim Miller. I am a uh, professor of politics here at the New School for Social Research and also the director of our graduate program in creative publishing and critical journalism, which is sponsoring tonight's event with uh, help and support from our dean's office led by Will Melberg. I'm also the author of a book just published entitled Can Democracy Work? And my book, along with books by many of our panelists tonight, will be available for sale after our event concludes. There will also be a reception with wine and cheese to mark the launch of uh, my new book and also uh, Helena Rosenblatt's new book. So I hope you'll join us for the reception too. Uh, the wine and cheese are free. I can't vouch for their quality. <laughs> For our panel tonight, I've invited a variety of editors and journalists who labor in the vineyards of left media, both old and new. I'll make a brief opening statement in a moment and then pose a couple of very uh, broad questions to our panelists. But before doing that, I want to introduce each of them in turn. And before doing that, I wanted to let you know that John Gould, uh, the editor of The New Republic, at the last minute was unable to join us tonight and sends his regrets. Representing that magazine in his place will be the publisher, my old friend and colleague Rachel Rosenfeld, who wants you to cut her some slack because she's been thrown into this ball game in the ninth inning with no time to warm up. Just hours. That's enough for most pitchers. Uh, and <laughs> now, in alphabetical order, our guest tonight, Atusa Araxia Abrahamian is a senior editor at The Nation and the author of The Cosmopolites, a book about the global market for citizenship. Her writing has appeared in The New York Times, New York Magazine, The London Review of Books, and many other publications. Sarah Leonard is executive editor of criminal justice publication The Appeal, a contributing editor to the nation and an editor at large at Dissent. She has co-edited two books, Occupy, an Occupy Wall Street inspired gazette published by Verso in 2011 with literary magazine M Plus One and forthcoming The Future We Want, Radical Solutions for the 21st Century and this is in conjunction with you and it Jacob. was forthcoming, I think, three ago, years ago. Well, I just took it off your website. But it can be forthcoming <laughs> for you uh, at any moment. I, I see. <laughs> now we see why the left has struggles. It's <laughs> <laughs> really the least of our problem. <laughs> Uh, Rachel Rosenfeld is publisher and vice president of the New Republic. She's the founding editor of the New Inquiry, uh, where actually a number of the people on this panel uh, have also published. And she's chair of the board of the Creative Publishing and Critical Journalism Program at the New School for Social Research. We wouldn't let her leave. Uh, Bashkar Sunkar is the founding editor and publisher of Jacobin a journal that has become must-reading in the present moment. He's also the publisher of Catalyst, a journal of theory and strategy, and the publisher of Tribune, a UK-based magazine. Is, are these correct facts? Besides his obvious entrepreneurial genius, Sunkara has written a variety of pieces for Jacobin, many on the topics we'll be discussing tonight, and he tells me he's just finished his first book entitled The Socialist Manifesto, which will be out next April, uh, published by Basic Books here in Verso in the UK. Uh, last but not least, our moderator tonight is my dear friend um, Helena Rosenblatt, who's professor of history at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. Her books include Rousseau in Geneva, Benjamin Constant and the Politics of Religion, and most recently, and just published and for sale after this event, The Lost History of Liberalism from Ancient Rome to the 21st Century. I've asked Helena to moderate because she is the soul of moderation, and also so I can join the conversation immoderately as is my want. To start, I want to read something I wrote today and have submitted as a possible op-ed, which probably won't get published, but it was prompted by uh, the op-ed that our president published in USA Today. 
uh, uh, this morning, and uh, it, it's directly on the topic uh, and, uh, of the, what we're going to be discussing, and I'm just going to put my own cards on the table. I don't expect uh, everyone here to uh, agree at all with what I'm about to say. A specter is haunting America, and according to President Donald J. Trump, it's the specter of socialism. Democrats, he asserts, in an op-ed for USA Today are planning, I quote, to model America's economy after Venezuela. <laughs> if they win control of Congress in November, he writes, quote, we will come dangerously closer to socialism in America. Trump's intervention forces a question that's been bubbling in political circles on the left ever since last summer when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, an avowed Democratic Socialist, won the Democratic Party primary in New York's 14th Congressional District. Is the influence of avowed socialists within the Democratic Party something to be feared, as a number of pundits wrote after her victory? Might their views risk splitting the party apart? Some Democratic Socialists warn that too many liberal Democrats are craven compromisers, sometimes in the pocket of Wall Street bankers, and therefore willing to shore up an unfair capitalist system that only deepens inequality in America. Some liberals respond that socialists are recklessly out of touch with the realities of market societies and mixed economies, or even worse, are power-hungry hypocrites like Lenin, who saw democracy as a means, not as an end in itself. Of course, it's absurd to suggest, as Trump does, that any Democrat wishes to model America on Venezuela. But it's true that Senators Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders want to renew the egalitarian edge of FDR's New Deal. Sanders and others in the Democratic Party urge that we create Medicare for all on the model of our federal social security program. Warren suggests bolstering the power of workers by requiring corporations to have 40% of their board of directors elected not by shareholders, but employees. That's a proposal strikingly similar to one in the, uh, this year's Labor Party manifesto in the UK. The debate over these proposals will shape the Democratic Party's identity in the next presidential race, and at issue are serious questions, including how we might, in practice, honor our characteristically American proposition in our Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. As this debate heats up, it's more important than ever, I believe, to acknowledge the many things professed liberal Democrats and avowed democratic socialists actually have in common. We Americans are especially prone to forget how the socialist movements of the 19th century crucially took up the banner of democracy in Europe and fought for the rights of ordinary people to participate meaningfully in politics, just as Andrew Jackson had fought under the banner of the Democratic Party in the 1830s in America. In the years that followed, the democratization of modern societies, even in the United States, was in part a result of socialists and small-d Democrats working hand-in-hand, hand, not at cross-purposes. Take the theme of equality. Socialists of all stripes aim to create a more egalitarian society through economic and social reforms. But the 18th century Americans who declared the nation's independence and the revolutionary thinkers who drafted the world's first democratic constitution in Paris in 1792 and 1793 pursued a similar ideal before socialism as a movement even existed. Or take the goal of self-government. The French philosopher and revolutionary politician Condorcet, a paragon of French Enlightenment values, drafted the world's first democratic constitution, eschewing the American Constitution's elaborate anti-majoritarian mechanisms for thwarting the power of ordinary people. But it was the British Chartists and their socialist heirs in Germany who two generations later pressed hard for the implementation of similarly democratic institutions in their homelands. It's worth acknowledging that the goals so ardently pursued by radical Democrats and socialists often have ended in defeat, if not the kinds of catastrophic violence that doomed Condorcet and his constitution. It's also worth acknowledging that both socialists and liberals have sometimes ended up betraying democratic ideals they both claimed to uphold. Lenin, an avowed proponent of democratic centralism, traduced the Russian upwelling of enthusiasm for democratic self-governance in the form of local city councils or Soviets and turned the Soviet Union into a one-party dictatorship. 
As conservatives also like to remind us, Woodrow Wilson, while claiming he would make a world safe for democracy, created in its name in America a vast administrative sta state staffed by unelected civil servants and operating, operating in its security and intelligence services under an undemocratic veil of secrecy. Liberal Democrats and democratic socialists need both to face, frankly, the failures and limitations of modern regimes run by remote elites and of socialist policies that have ranged from the admirable yet costly social safety nets created in Scandinavia to the command economies that proved so ruinous in the Soviet Union and elsewhere. The idea that anyone of any political orientation at this juncture of human affairs has a clear idea of how best to institute a free society of equals is to me simply laughable. What can realistically be expected from human beings who aspire to be self-governing? What if any kinds of inequality are justified ever? There is so much we don't know. But while it's always worth questioning our assumptions about the ultimate goals we profess as Democrats, liberals, and socialists, and I regard myself as upholding aspects of all three traditions, it's also worth keeping in mind a common enemy. The authoritarian elites that strive to maintain their control of political power as a few super rich individuals and families keep getting richer and ever more insulated from the accidents of fate that define everyday life for the remaining 99% of the globe's population. What President Trump is trying to do at this juncture of our political history is to divide and conquer the Democratic Party. And what we Democrats can't repeat is the mistake that liberals and democratic socialists made in Weimar Germany in 1933 to allow our various areas of disagreement to cloud what ought to be our common hope, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So that's my manifesto. In my original invitation, um, to the panelists, um, I remarked uh, about some of the things I just uh, said in my little spiel, and I asked a couple of uh, questions, um, the first of which is, what are the similarities and salient differences within the ongoing resistance on the left to the authoritarian and racist drift of American politics under Donald Trump? I also ask, and perhaps more importantly, what role should political media play in addressing the questions that surround socialism, liberalism, and the future of democracy today? Uh, more recently, in an email I sent last week, I proposed we start very counterintuitively by addressing at the outset some very basic and very abstract questions about our ultimate goals. I use the word ultimate to allude to Georg Lukacs and his famous attack in Tactics and Ethics on Kautsky and the German SPD for lacking clarity about strategy and tactics because they didn't always keep in mind the ultimate goal as Karl Marx had, according to Lukacs. I therefore asked all the panelists, apart from Helena, to start by answering two simple but impossible questions. And they are, first, what do you think should be our ultimate political goal? The answers I suggested could range from the abolition of the state. Some of us spent time as anarchists, as I was in my younger days, uh, to uh, some form of uh, you know, uh, um, horizontal democracy as pursued in Occupy Wall Street or, or some other form of government. Uh, there's, I think, many different answers one could give to that question. The second question, what do you think should be our ultimate economic goal. Again, I'm assuming most of us here don't believe like Hayek and von Mies in um, uh, unmitigated laissez-faire free market capitalism. I also assume most of us don't uh, support a command economy such as existed in the Soviet Union and its satellites for about 50 years. Uh, but are we pursuing a mixed economy? And if so, mixed in what degree and uh, range between markets and state regulation, or are we actually aiming ultimately at a post-capitalist society, and if that's what we're aiming at, what would that look like? Um, I have a variety of answers I could give to that last question, but I'd like to hear uh, what um, our panelists have to say. And I ask these questions because in left journalism and uh, writing, in my experience, um, when one is down in the trenches fighting the good fight, however one understands it, 
um, it's uh, often easy to lose sight of the larger questions about um, uh, some of the big issues that may in fact uh, be sources of tension between liberals and socialists. So I turn the so microphone over. And is this on? Um, yeah. Is it? Okay. So we'll give, give each panelist um, up to about five minutes, not more, to kind of answer that question broadly in any way he or she feels comfortable with. This works? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I don't have like a, a comprehensive answer. I'm not Plato, I'm not Rawls, and I'm not Jim Miller. However, um, I do think there is an answer to the question that, that is really fundamental. Um, and my answer, unfortunately, plays totally into what Donald Trump said in his op-ed, and that is that borders and the movement of people is, is totally fundamental to the society we want in the future. Um, and in, right now, and even more so in the future, people are gonna have to move. Uh, I think that it's um, a, a moral imperative that people should live where they want, but I also think it's really important that people don't have to move if they don't want to. And the reason that so many people are moving now is that they have to, right? There's climate stuff, there's war, there's economic issues. Um, what people forget in the conversation about open borders and immigration is that honestly most people would prefer not to. Um, everybody who is moving from Syria, maybe not everybody, a lot of people who are fleeing the war in Syria would really much rather be at home in peacetime. Um, people tend to be quite attached to their communities. People tend to uh, enjoy spending time with their family. So this, this idea that if you open the border, the hordes will come you know, flooding in is, is just wrong. I, I don't think that that's how people think and live and, and want to live. Um, however, people do need to move for a variety of reasons, personal, political, economic, now climate. And uh, the, the world we want has to accommodate that. It will be a matter of, it is a matter of life or death. It will be even more so. And so we have to find a way that can both not force people to move unless they want to. And if they do want to or have to, welcome them. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's really hard. Um, that's kind of the situation we're in now. There is, enormous tension between political parties about how many people should be able to move, about how they should be treated, should they move at all, um, are they welcome, are they not, and the question of who belongs is a really fundamental question to democracy because democracy is made up of people and, and it, it, the, the constituents are the people who are let in. Uh, in a bordered world, not everyone is let in and it is inherently discriminatory to have you know, any bordered democracy or any other system because not everybody is welcome. Um, and so I know this is very abstract, but, but I think that the world I want is one where if people want to live somewhere, they can. Um, but also, if people want to live somewhere, they do have a certain responsibility to the place they live. Um, again, at the same time, let's say this responsibility is language. You know, If you move to the US, you should speak English. You hear this from the right all the time. That's not a crazy thing to, to want or to aspire to. You also can't say, well, figure it out yourself. Like, go watch the defunded Sesame Street. You know, go, go like, listen to PBS that we aren't going to give any money to. Like, that's not, that's crazy. Um, you need a social infrastructure that helps people learn the language, if that is, in fact, what you want. <clears throat> so there's a lot of work to do in that area, but I, I do think that fixing migration and mobility um, is absolutely imperative. We currently have a world where this, this situation exists for very, very rich people. I've, my writing has uh, concerned this um, a lot, and I've done a lot of reporting about how, for the very rich, borders don't exist. You can buy your way across borders. You can flatten borders for a price. Um, you can literally buy passports in a half dozen countries. You can buy residence permits in virtually every developed country in the world. Um, and it, it, sometimes it doesn't even matter if you're a criminal, you know? This, uh, but it's not a criminal enterprise unless you think that citizenship itself is, and, and I kind of am sympathetic to that view. But, um, I mean, nations and the system of citizenship we have. But, you know, it's, it's perfectly legal to buy a passport. It is perfectly legal to buy a green card. And this is a privilege, not a right, in the current system. 
Um, it would be really nice if everybody had access to the same mobility that the ultra wealthy do. And that leads me to the, the next question, I guess, which is how much inequality are we willing to tolerate? Um, I don't think there, there should be any inequality, legally speaking. I think everybody should be treated the same, or more or less the same, depending on where they're coming from. Um, but when it comes to immigration, it's totally uh, unethical to say, OK, if you're rich, like you can come live wherever you want. And if you're poor, you can't. Um, that's pretty undemocratic, in my opinion. And so a world where we, we afford poor people and normal middle class people and people who are not part of the 0.1% the same mobility as the 1% currently enjoy, um, that, would be, that would be an improvement. So um, these are the biggest possible questions, obviously. So um, I will uh, give us a perfect plan that we can aim for in the medium term. And that's a joke. And <laughs> like it, not a good one, apparently. Um, so I think, you know, um, like some other people on this panel, perhaps I identify as a socialist, I am a socialist, um, and that is the context in which I do my work. I'm a member of Democratic Socialists of America since 2010, which now makes me like an extreme veteran of DSA, uh, because everybody joined in the last year and a half or two years, uh, which has been quite exciting to see. Um, DSA is, is multi-tendency, so it actually doesn't prescribe any specific end that we're going towards, which is inconvenient for me, because then I could just tell you what it was. Um, but we start from the premise, obviously, that uh, you know capitalism is exploitive because it takes people's labor, pays them less than what it's worth, and completely controls their lives. And we don't like that. Um, and one of the sort of like utopian frameworks that people have come up with to describe what we're after so as to get away from a sort of nostalgic valorization of the mid-century worker at the auto plant. You know, auto plants actually were not that fun. Um, and so we, we try to get away from, from a sort of nostalgia. And one of the frameworks that people have come up with is fully automated luxury communism, which is like as good as it sounds pretty much. Um, the idea being that given technological advances, I mean, it's a little tongue in cheek, but given technological advances, we ought to be able to produce abundance, as in fact we do, increasingly without everybody have to, having to work all the time. And certainly not having to work under horrible conditions, certainly not having to work multiple jobs or all their waking hours. The idea that we could have, that we can imagine a communism of abundance and actually joy and pleasure instead of something that sounds like austerity, that sounds kind of like what we have or like what we historically have seen and would like to avoid. Um, you know, when we talk about the sort of plans, um, it's always hard to draw a blueprint for your utopia, but I think there has been a lot of work done around worker ownership. I think we would like to see a society in which um, fundamentally democracy is extended to the workplace. It's extended to the economy. It has much deeper roots in day-to-day -day life. This is about achieving better democracy. And so we imagine firms in which workers hire their managers as needed. You know, um, This is a system in which the sort of democratic organization of the workplace as well as other parts of political life are paramount. Um, and I think we would talk a lot about public ownership. And actually, I think a great contribution of Jacobin has been relentlessly writing articles about the Meidner <coughs> plan, which literally no one else, I think, <laughs> would, would take the time to do. In other words, exploring failed attempts at public ownership and the ways in which capital has pushed back in order to make them impossible, but using them as templates to see how we might see a way forward. And 
you mentioned political journalism and the media, and I think a very, very important role that left media is playing right now is there are a lot of these abandoned plans or work that's been done, work that was defeated, work that might still be good, that because it was defeated is no longer accessible and you can't, um, it's, it's hard to find our origins as leftists. It's hard to find the knowledge that we've accumulated over the years because a lot of it belongs to defeated movements that whose work has not been well cataloged. Um, I find this often as a, um, as a left feminist, that some of the essential texts of the 70s are not in print anymore. And so I actually think a very important role of left media is doing this work of bringing this information back and bringing it back as a, as a resource for all the active political work we're doing now. Um, I think, you know, when we talk about uh, workplace democracy and so forth, of course, I think the first thing many people think is, well, that sounds really hard. And it is really hard, um, but it's no more utopian than thinking that the rich will run the economy in a way that doesn't drive us into the ground and perhaps um, melt the planet, as seems likely. Um, and so I think that it behooves us to actually look at the concrete experiments where this is being, um, being attempted. Um, and so, I don't know, I guess we can talk more about that, but, but I think that, that the sort of utopian element of that gets overstated. Um, it is true that I think my socialist utopia involves a lot of meetings. Self-governance is pretty hard. I was just reading accounts of attempts at worker organization in the former Yugoslavia, and uh, man, those were some brutal meetings. That was, you know, this is like, attempts at worker organization that don't always leave you completely hopeful, but also in a way, again, it, you know, they leave you no less hopeful than looking at the world as it is. It's like, okay, that's something we can work with. Um, so I think it's worth saying um, you know, that, that our fundamental goals in restructuring the economy is to create more democracy throughout society. It's to push back capitalism's imposition on day-to-day -day life. Um, and I had one more extremely important point. Um, I think something that gets lost when we talk about our utopia is one of the reasons we have, um, we seek to extend beyond something like Sweden or Norway, which may seem lovely, or seek to extend beyond the New Deal. There are really two reasons. One is very practical, which is if you leave the powers that be in place, they will ultimately push back. Um, and you will end up where we are today on our back foot. You should always be on the offense. The other is that without an inspiring vision, as you alluded to, Jim, um, people don't have anything to fight for. And I think the Democratic Party has actually learned that recently, when in fact you put forward a sort of already compromised position, people don't have anything to fight for. And it's very hard to move people. And in fact, when a socialist jumps into the race, it's not that everybody's on board with socialism. It's that people see an actual vision there. So in sum, all social systems have passed, as will capitalism. And uh, I think our utopia is that it will be succeeded by something far more democratic. Can you hear me? Sorry, this is like far away from my face. Um, gosh, uh, so I mean, I should say I'm I'm a publisher, not a writer of political books or um, an editor at a political magazine. So I'm approaching this from a different perspective, um, and I definitely don't know how to answer Jim's questions. Um, what the ideal politics should be. Um, I'm, I view myself as a student of my co-panelists here uh, over many years, and I've learned my politics by just the sort of uh, experimental process of, of organizing political thinkers and enabling them and feeling out blindly the ways in which their voices can be amplified or how, how uh, an idea could come to fruition and have an impact in the world. Um, so I'm gonna focus on the role of political media in my response and maybe I'll just be really daring by the end and say something about the political ideal outcome. 
Um, but um, we'll see. Um, uh, so, I mean, to take it back, uh, or just to provide an anecdote that I think about a lot, when I taught with Jim at this program, a question that was asked of me all the time was how I knew, how did you know that you wanted to work in media? Or how did you know you wanted to do this? And the truthful answer is I still don't know. I mean, I really don't feel good about it always. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but I do feel like uh, a sense of duty um, by uh, at, on the heels of the accident of history that led you know, me to meet Sarah and Atusa and the other people that were part of New Inquiry, and for that to have been successful by some metric that you know we hadn't imagined, and then for as long as that became a vehicle that another person couldn't have just willed into being, it was my duty to make the most of it and not be basically unreflective about that um, up up until relatively recently. Um, uh, Politically speaking, you know, in this effort, in this like sort of experiment with ideas and media, um, starting with New Inquiry and then to Verso and now the New Republic, um, I've obviously had you know po alleged political affiliations across the spectrum. Uh, we used to call New Inquiry the Jacobin of the left, and New Inquiry. So it's like very you know now that I'm here representing the liberal, which I've never you know could never conceive of. Um, you know, a, a year ago, um, but um, but I think that you know something I think about with when I think about the role of political media, it's on some level not to think when you're when you are the media. So for me, I'm the publisher, and I'm thinking about the vessel. I'm not producing the program. I'm not stipulating the. I'm not you know kind of the outlines that the people hear. Um, you know, are better suited to, I'm thinking about what limited role media can possibly have in doing anything at all about any of it. Um, and so I don't feel particularly concerned about having the right answer to that question. I, I am concerned with m kind of mainly having there, or kind of like in general, I think I'm pretty right. Uh, I'd rather have me be in this position than someone else. Um, and you know, kind of being aware that that the power that we have is is so limited that we don't need to stress out about you know what if we were gods or kings and we were you know saying this is the political program everyone should have and this is the economic program that everyone should have. Um, it's much more about sort of uh, maximizing the limited power that there is to just get these ideas to resonate with publics and to build coalitions that are broadly construed on the left that can have any sort of power, any sort of sense of belonging or impact. Um, and so right now, I mean, I think that, you know, when the state is, is a bad state, when there's no feedback loop and you see something like the Women's March happen where um, citizenship is sort of exhibiting itself as something that is completely independent of the state um, transcending the state, um, you know, whatever people that were part of that protest thought they were doing is interesting to me. I have no idea what I was doing myself, and that's an interesting question to answer um, in being part of it. Um, but you know, to to kind of mobilize uh, the symbols that that inspire people to create some sort of counterweight um, to authoritarian power to the accumulation of power within the state and to hopefully seize that power um, and to um, do it by any means necessary. Um, so I guess the, I don't know if that made any sense at all. Um, I'll talk, ask me questions if it didn't and I will answer them um, as we go. But I guess, um, you know, the closest thing I can say to what has been motivating for me as a political concept is something in the realm of a communitarian democratic concept and you know democratic as a social idea um, distinct from a political idea even um, which is sort of the form by which I've myself participated in culture and that I've seen culture uh, shape the imaginations of of 
people that um, act on the ground and, uh, and by the means by which the world changes. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I um, agree with much of what's been said, but I agree with everything Sarah said. We co-edited this book two years ago <laughs> mm -hmm. together. It's still, there's many of them still available. Hopefully it's because they're printing more. Yeah, hopefully it's because they're printing more and it's not just the original run, <laughs> but uh, we'll see. Um, but, so I think that from the offset, I should just say that socialism isn't an anti-liberalism in my conception. Uh, I think that a true socialist tradition stands in the Enlightenment tradition. It looks at the dream of liberty, of equality, of solidarity, and it tries to actualize them. So in other words, capitalism has created this tremendous abundance around us. It's created the possibility of a different sort of world, but it also at the same time frustrates those possibilities. Um, and a lot of the advances of the past 150 plus years have actually made this a humane world. You know, I, you don't have to go as far as like, Pinker to say that this is probably the best time to be alive. Uh, I just am afraid that we're standing on the edge of a cliff, and, and all the stuff that Atusa mentioned will, will, you know, will mean that, you know, you probably don't want to be alive in 10 or 20 years. Um, but for now, I mean, it, it, we're living in a world that's not the worst of all possible worlds. We're living in a world in which uh, the left and workers' movements as a whole had made significant advances to, to humanize the world, to fight for suffrage, to fight for, um, you know, just over the past 150 years, uh, uh, both the, you know, the, the struggles and advances in civil rights. And there's a reason why the workers' movement as a whole and socialists of all stripes, both revolutionaries and reformists, once called themselves social democrats, because it was an ideal about extending the fruits of democracy from just winning it in the political sphere, but also extending it into social and economic uh, spheres. So obviously it's one of the great tragedies of this movement is that um, some, a wing of this social democratic movement later morphed into uh, kind of a more authoritarian uh, socialist you know, uh, conception. So, but fundamentally, I do share an impulse that many traditional liberals would consider a totalitarian impulse. And that when I look around me at the uh, many miseries of the world, I see not just symptoms to solve, but I believe that there is a system that's producing many of these, these outcomes. Again, producing the conditions to overcome these outcomes, but also producing these uh, outcomes. So my, my dream is still a world without the exploitation of person by person, a world without oppression, without sexism and racism and all sorts of oppression, and a world in which hierarchy is mitigated. I don't actually think we could do away with all forms of, of hierarchy, all forms of divisions of labor, but I think we can uh, mitigate it. So in other words, if you're a parent and you wield authority over a, um, a minor, over a child, there should be, there's rules in which your authority is governed. You can't beat your child, you can't prevent your child from going to school, you can't prevent your child from leaving the house once they become an adult, and so on. But that's, in other words, a relationship that we've thought about in a society, we questioned and we found kind of limits. And I think other forms of hierarchy will be much the same, but it's still uh, you know, a part of a democratic process and, and accountability. But in the old language, my dream of what should be our ultimate political goal would have been called the dictatorship of the proletariat. It would be called not a dictatorship in the old sense of personal rule, one person dictatorship, but in the idea of a rule by a uh, social class for the abolition of that social class itself. So one simple way to, to think about it is we all set certain, Marxists in particular have always had the pretense of being scientific socialists. In other words, there's something objective about what we are saying, what we're doing, and so on. Um, and I would say as a framework, as a way of analyzing the world, it is rooted in something objective. Um, you know, there are, we live in a world with private property, and some people own private property and some people don't. And that's a very important defining feature of the world, and it mitigates and, and determines not every relationship and many relationships in the world. So that's, that's an objective thing. But the reason why we oppose capitalism is because of a normative kind of moral and ethical stance where, where socialists think that hierarchy and exploitation are bad, and to whatever extent it can be mitigated, it should be mitigated. Now, I added some caveats, maybe about to what extent it can be mitigated, 
but this is a, a normative stance. Um, you might say that uh, we would all agree in this room that, for example, slavery is a form, or feudalism, are forms of exploitation and forms of hierarchy that no one wants to continue or persist. The socialist case is that the wage-labor relation isn't the worker-starve choice that so many people live by, is in fact an unacceptable form of hierarchy um, and exploitation. So, but my conception of, of what this worker state this, this world after capitalism as a political form should be, isn't a post-political conception. So in other words, uh, socialists in, let's say, the Leninist variety have often thought about the withering way of the, the state. And to some extent, I think there's large parts of the states that, that can be withered away. Militaries, um, uh, prisons, and other kind of the coercive apparatus of the state can be brought down to, I think, a bare, um, a bare minimum. Uh, I think we might uh, one day in a socialist future have some sort of police force, but I think they certainly wouldn't be armed and they, we certainly won't be incarcerating people for uh, decades and decades of their life and so on and so on. But there will be other decisions and other debates that aren't necessarily rooted in a class antagonism. Like for example, if we need to find a way to cross the Hudson and Jim wants to build a tunnel and I want to build a bridge, there might be all sorts of contesting interests from neighborhoods or from other things, you'll need a state to mediate. So I think in that case, we'll need a democratic, radical worker state, and that's the political vision, but it also it leaves something that's open-ended. So in other words, racism, sexism won't um, uh, resolve itself overnight. So you'll need, civil, in civil society, continued actions, continued mobilizations, and so on. You'll also need, in civil society, the opportunity for people to have contesting views. So for example, in a social society, I imagine there'd be a left-wing party that'd be advocating for greater democratic planning and so on, um, maybe more egalitarian wage scales, and there'd be parties on the far right advocating the restoration of capitalism, there'd be parties on the center right advocating just more market mechanisms and, and, and life and, and so on. And obviously this also democratic sphere also has to be connected to a bedrock of rights. There are certain things the state should have no business interfering in. Um, I would even go as far more further than most socialists in saying that if you know a parent wants their child to have some level of like religious instruction and have some time after school to do things like that, I mean th these are I think rights that this the state cannot, cannot trample on. Now when it comes to our our um, you know economic uh, goals, you know, I, I should say that the goal of socialism, I think, is primarily a goal of, of freedom. But the question the socialists ask is freedom for who? So in other words, if you are an employer and you just took a tremendous entrepreneurial risk to create a new, a new factory or a new place of work or something that's creating, creating wealth, you might say that it's an unreasonable burden that a new left social democratic party comes in and says, uh, your employers, um, employees has to get paid their full salaries but can only work for 35 hours a week because you have all this fixed cost and you have people that were just two weeks ago willing to work for 45 hours, now they have to work 35 hours. But what we're doing is we're expanding the sphere of freedom for these people and they now have 10 more hours of their life to pursue their hobbies, spend time with their family, do whatever they want. So their, their scope for freedom and activity through these reforms are expanded but for the minority of people that that benefit from the status quo or whatnot, like their rights are constr constricted. But fundamentally when it comes to an economic vision, I think that this is something that will have to be decided through a political process. We'll have to find the balance. My hunch is that there will be um, massive room for, at the commanding heights of the economy, um, certain levels of planning. So we know, for example, that a national health service works pretty well and you don't really need many market mechanisms to make it work well. Even uh, a state like Cuba is really good at doing things like um, doing primary school education, ensuring basic literacy, doing things like ensuring health care, hurricane you know, evacuations, vaccinations, like the, the things that um, are kind of rote, routinized tasks and so on. And I think that we could imagine that huge spheres of life that are currently held hostage to the market could be enjoyed as social rights with elements of democratic planning and elements of state guarantees. Um, I think that there will probably also have to be a continued role for markets, which existed before capitalism and existed after. Um, the way that I envision a society like this would be 
that the means of production, to use again the old Marxist language, would still be owned by the state but would be controlled by workers who would essentially rent it from the state and manage it democratically within certain constraints. And the constraints that I would advocate would be, again, the restriction of wage labor. So instead, people would be kind of shareholders in their, in their, um, in their fir firms and receive a share of the, the, the profits in their, their firm and be allowed to, within certain constraints, um, like legal constraints as far as labor regulation and so on, govern them as they see fit. So, for example, you might find that in a socialist society you have to pay custodians more than you pay other entry-level work because if someone can exist uh, pretty happily on a welfare state, like, chances are they won't want to be in a miserable, you know, paid, paid job as a custodian, so you might have custodians paid more than people doing other enjoyable entry-level works and so on. But I think fundamentally that socialists have to acknowledge that the problems we often debate when we think about the command economies and so on, the way that the old socialism failed, we often think about the, the problems of calculation. Like you need markets to solve the calculation problem. I go further than most socialists in that I think that a lot of these problems are also incentive problems. Um, for the, you need to have, I think we are still at a place in society where we need to create new products and new services and whatnot, and we need incentives for people to create those new products and services. I think that worker-managed firms can actually do that, but it needs to be an environment where there's firm failure, where people um, are um, were inefficient and weak for firms um, uh, are allowed to fall, where people who aren't doing their job correctly are allowed to be fired, but then they're landing on the cushion of a welfare state and a society that gives them not just voice in the workplace, but also the ability to exit the workplace, too. Oh. Wow. Yes. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Uh, your responses are um, sufficiently varied and heterogeneous. Uh, that it seems to me I have a lot to chew on. To my surprise, I don't find myself um, uh, in terms of ultimate goals being uh, that far away from what um, you've just said, um, Bashkar. Uh, or even uh, what Otusa has said about the idea of borderless movement, um, which I think for uh, a number of people uh, is, uh, it seems like, uh, a distant ultimate goal. Uh, after World War II, the United Nations guaranteed the right to exit countries, but not the right to enter countries. So uh, we have kind of uh, a glass half full, but people are stuck in refugee camps without the capacity to enter and pursue opportunities in uh, uh, other countries. And uh, it seems to me these, these kinds of um, topics get pressed, as several of you have alluded, willy-nilly by the evolution of globalization as a byproduct of capitalism, which itself knocks down borders uh, between uh, the movement of goods, services, uh, ideas, and uh, why labor markets shouldn't be part of the borderless society is an open question. I suppose, um, listening to all of this, there are parts, uh, uh, you know, I have a couple of questions I would like to pose. And, uh, you know, one of them has to do with the role of utopia and idealism in uh, how we approach politics. Uh, the last time I was on uh, a panel with Sarah Leonard, it was on a panel about utopian thinking and its value. Uh, and it seems to me there is a place uh, for idealism and utopian thinking, and that one of the real problems with uh, Melioris liberals is they set their targets too low, and as a result they end up uh, not offering people something to aim at or, or a vision to pursue. Uh, that said, um, fully automated luxury communism uh, I remember I, uh, in 1969, was at a Students for a Democratic Society convention in a balcony working with the anarchist Murray Bookchin, who had just published a book called Post-Scarcity Anarchism. And Murray was pretty certain that we were, we were already at the stage of fully automated 
um, he wouldn't have used the word luxury. That would have grated on his old union organizing nerves. Um, but the, so there are a couple of questions I want to pose, and uh, th they were brought up by you, Sarah, but uh, they're really aimed at anybody at the panel who wants to pick them up. One is that take a vision like post-scarcity anim anarchism or fully automated luxury communism. What does this vision mean in a, a moment where a hurricane is pounding Georgia, uh, where there have never been hurricane strength winds all that far inland because of climate change? And uh, the 19th century, early 20th century vision of uh, mass production producing mass affluence uh, uh, with nobody paying much attention to what was being pumped into the atmosphere to drive these machines. Uh, it's a very um, powerful vision in both the New Deal and in communist artworks actually from the 1930s. Um, and isn't there, um, uh, it would seem that there are um, limits that um, the classic 19th century uh, utopian socialists and, and, and communist thinkers like Karl Marx really never anticipated, and doesn't that put a crimp in this kind of a vision? Uh, the second uh, question that arises is the romance of defeated movements. Um, it's true that there is a past that always uh, uh, is in danger of slipping out of view, uh, uh, that the losers of history have their records erased. Uh, we felt that way in the 60s, and we resurrected all kinds of anarchist, council communist texts, and we worked in you know, a variety of left journals. I was an editor at Telos, and that was important work to do, and it seems like we keep doing it over and over again. But it seems to me that um, when one starts to point, I'm going to take an iconic event uh, on the left, uh, at, at an event like the Paris Commune, which I write about in my book, um, which is a failure uh, for very complicated reasons, which are not worth getting into here. But the fact that um, you have uh, socialist uh, thinkers as different as Kropotkin, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Lenin, uh, uh, treating this uh, as uh, a, a kind of um, inspiring touchstone for what we should do, I find a little puzzling because, you know, to do that, uh, for one thing, when Karl Marx uh, does this in his book about the Paris Commune, uh, he's, to me, abandoning the best part of his own legacy, which is a tough-minded historical realism, which would ask the question, well, maybe there were reasons it failed. Maybe we should look at that. And I'm particularly interested in this as somebody who has spent my life thinking about participatory democracy, because it seems to me that these moments over and over again indicate um, uh, profound, uh, I would say structural limitations to the capacity of ordinary people to uh, genuinely come together and sustain uh, democratic institutions at the level of intensity that is required to pull off uh, uh, something like a, a, a participatory democracy. I furthermore think that we know that uh, these movements in practice under moments of duress, I think of Occupy Wall Street, uh, have a long history of willy-nilly um, ceding power to unaccountable leaders who are manipulating events from behind the scenes. So that there's, uh, it would seem to me that the, uh, one of the tensions between idealism and realism is to have a reckoning with the various experiments on the left that have actually been run, and why do they come up short? And isn't there some uh, um, need uh, for people on the left to attend to that? Uh, my only other uh, comment uh, that I'll say at this point is I'm not sure, uh, Bashkar, why you keep uh, using the phrase dictatorship of the proletariat. It seems to me just politically a really bad idea in this day and age. We're, we're among friends. <laughs> <laughs> Even among friends. Uh, but yes. And um, so I have lots of questions. Um, I'll, I'll try to um, 
I try to be short about them to give you as much time as possible to answer um, these questions. And so the first thing I'm just going to say, I mean, there's some beautiful ideas that you have expressed here, ideas <laughs> that we um, that it's easy to, to admire and agree with. On the other hand, you know, there is this disconnect that we all understand between dreaming these big, big um, dreams and making them happen, right? And I, I sometimes talk about, uh, I had this realization, I had this discussion with my mother once about my kids who were going to a private school in Switzerland, and they were with a lot of, um, uh, can you hear me? Um, and they were, they had a lot of very, very, very wealthy friends. And so I, w I was always griping and telling my mother, oh my goodness, they're so, so uh, spoiled, and my kids are going to get spoiled, and they're surrounded so unreal, and it's just these, these really super rich kids. Um, it's not a great environment, you know. And so my mother, who is a regular middle class, uh, upper middle class person, very feet on the ground, a do medical doctor, she just looked at me at one point, and she said, Helena, um, rich people aren't worse than poor people. They just have more money. So, so the point I'm saying is that why would turning over power to poorer people or to workers, why, are you, why would you think that this would work, that they would embrace the vision that you have? Is there any, is there any evidence that they would actually agree with this vision. When we look at how they're voting, when we look at how they're acting in this country, is there reason for optimism? Um, or should we look at the world more like um, Hobbes and say, you know, people are really um, by nature selfish, brutish, and violent? And <laughs> I'm sorry to to play be the cynic here, but it's also in in for th for the conversation, and I went on further than more than I wanted to. But. I can try to yeah. tackle a range of <laughs> things <laughs> that have been raised, but quickly. Um, uh, so there's no nobility does not reside in a social class. I don't think that's the point that anyone here would make. I think what we're talking about is whether or not you believe in democracy. It's true that uh, if you believe in democracy, then you have to be interested in the opinions of a wider range of people. Um, I think if, in fact, the argument is that uh, poor people are brutish and may undo democracy by participating more fully in it, then we have to rethink our complete political framework and abandon democracy altogether. Um, and. I would not do that myself because I have an ethical commitment to self-governance. Um, I mean, there was recently a useful op-ed and a study that pointed out that centrists were, in fact, more antithetical to democracy than people on the far right or the far left, mm -hmm. and cited, um, you know, lower opinions by people in the center of civil rights, free and fair elections, um, and stronger approval of strong leaders. Um, and so the idea that authoritarianism somehow resides on the left or the right, as opposed to the center where people valiantly defend the status quo and the horrific hierarchies that exist, um, I don't really think makes any sense. Um, and this is not some sort of mushy idea about um, you know, people at the bottom being more morally reasonable or ethical than people at the top, although it has been shown that a disproportionate number of CEOs are sociopaths, and that was also in the New York Times. Um, so I think, you know, when we think about the sort of world that we want in which the greater number of people govern society, which when you put it that way doesn't actually sound that radical, um, what, what, so, but sorry, this is a beautiful what sure. you're saying, but just to get back, like, wh what makes you think that workers necessarily don't want capitalism and don't want the chance to make lots of money? Well, we will and never that get they to want the equality. we're talking about unless they want something different. That's what organizing is. But and, yeah. But, like, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I agree, agree with what Sarah said, but I think the additional thing is just people are, we have to assume the baseline assumption we're, we're making is not that workers are good or bad, but that people are rational actors. So in other words, we are assuming, we are assuming that people know when they're getting beaten and oppressed. So, so in other words, a, sla a, 
think, think, about, think about slavery, right? If someone is a slave in 1864, 1865, there's a chance that they're fleeing their plantation or with, when the Union troops advance, they're striking first and slitting their master's throats and, and breaking for the Union lines. So are those people any different than the people 200 years ago? Were their ancestors just idiots? Were they like, oh, their ancestors thought slavery was fine and we're fine with being slaves? No. People know when they're getting oppressed. They know when they're getting a bad deal. But they are acting, and they know at the very least, they're not maybe utility maximizers, but they very least try to satisfy their basic needs and to prevent themselves from getting abused and, and oppressed and whatever else. But they're operating within certain constraints. So if Rachel and I are both, um, are both workers, but we're in different parts of the country, I'm in a region with 1% un unemployment, Rachel's in a place with 10% unemployment. It might be very rational for me to join a union drive and go on strike. It might not be rational for Rachel to join a union a dr a drive and go on strike. So the relationship between capitalists and, and workers is a, um, they're, they're both dependent on each other, but it's an asymmetrical dependency. Any individual worker uh, needs their job more than a capitalist needs an individual worker. So when I look around at the world, I see people generally acting rational. I think the goal of the left is to create other options so people can pursue the route of collective action. I also want to zoom out for just a second and say that I think the premise of conversations like these is often a little bit of a bait and switch where we want to, uh, the idea at the beginning is to articulate a utopia. Um, and then the question is, but it kind of looks like people don't want that utopia. Yeah, it's a utopia. We're not there yet. <laughs> like we're, I think there's, um, when we talk about the thing that we want, it's because it's better than what we have. We're not there yet. And the way that you get there is through a certain amount of organizing and persuasion uh, through forms like this one. And I think you know, we as leftists who are asking for something outside of the existing system, the burden is necessarily on us to articulate, of course, like, like what is this weird thing that you want, which I certainly understand and I think is a reasonable question. Um, but it's also true that nobody wonders what Nancy Pelosi's dream of utopia is. You know, it's a thing that is only asked of people <laughs> who want more of a change. Um, and much as we are asked, well, isn't it, uh, you know, aren't you worried that when people have more self-governance, they'll make the wrong choices? You know, it, there's no evidence that people can take care of themselves in this way. I mean, for us, obviously, I, I don't mean this to sound flip, but there's no evidence that, you know, capitalism can sustain itself without a regime of enslavement, mass murder, mass incarceration, legalized murder, and colonialism. So it's like, we want something better, you know? Like, mm -hmm. surely we can do better than that. <laughs> and I think so, so we take that as sort of a, a moral premise as well, that we, have to think about how we. Well, I, I want to put a question to you, but I see that uh, Atusa wants to say something. Yeah. Oh, I just want to say I do. I do think that rich people are are worse, and <laughs> <laughs> and I I too went to a, a yeah. Swiss private school, so <laughs> I think. <laughs> So, I think we're, but you know, we're rich people, right? Like globally, we're at the top, probably ten. So are you worse? People. Oh, definitely. I mean, listen, <laughs> in terms of like carbon consumption, I, I am, I am worse, right? There are so many metrics by which I am so much worse, and you, and and you, and mm -hmm. all of us. And um, but I think it's because we, we, it's <laughs> not about, it's not about, it's not about the number in your bank account, or or even necessarily your class. It's about these enormous disparities, and we live in a system that encourages rich people to be and act worse. Um, I don't think that if rich people were better, our world would necessarily be better. But but the the, the gaping differences between, the gaping disparities between rich people and not rich people are, are what makes our world pretty crummy. Yeah. And so yes, rich people are worse. It's not because they fail as people, but it's because they, they get these incentives that are, yeah, yeah well, well also, they have more money and, and, and there are many people who don't have enough. What's also about the the work of organizing that's been brought up a lot and the work of actually, like when you don't have access to power, when you can't just donate to political campaigns, then you have to participate in the building of democratic communities. You have to participate in action. You have to be shaped 
by forces that are outside of yourself. And that participation, the more that we can enable that, the more we can remove the barriers to that for people who are not just arbitrarily born into wealth and can pay their way up, but up to actually like sh shape the world that they are gonna live in, that have to assert uh, the publics that they um, constitute and, also, and solve the problems that they experience, that they feel even if they don't quite know, um, that they suffer even if mm -hmm. it is not s officially seen. Um, and that process is a, is a transformative process. Um, it's a process through which self-actualization and the liberation of the soul is possible. And that process is, um, is an elevating one. And yes, I think poor people or the people that are excluded from democracy are the people that are on the transformative edge of democracy. And participation is both a means and an end of the world that we want. Uh, so um, uh, I, I want to, um, and I take what Sarah Leonard just said, that there is a kind of bait and switch here. But uh, I think uh, putting out um, ultimate goals and then trying to figure out tactics and strategy is part of what I had in mind. So um, let me s go back to Atusa's vision of a borderless socialism, which she quipped uh, is she's giving aid and comfort to Trump because Trump attacked in his op-ed. He said Democrats want a borderless socialism. It's true. And uh, so uh, I mean, uh, not, that's not the Democrats. <laughs> well, no, that's what he said. I'm just telling what he said. Um, if only. Uh, if only. <laughs> so here is. Uh, Here's a counterexample that I've been uh, mulling over uh, that I find very um, frightening. And it has to do in part with the tension between um, democratic uh, uh, aspirations, liberalism and socialism, and cosmopolitanism versus nationalism, which is something we haven't really discussed explicitly, but I want to bring it to bear here. Um, because in uh, going around and talking about my book, um, I am struck by what has happened in countries like Hungary and Poland. And I'm struck because in both instances, these uh, are countries with a very imperfect, flawed, um, liberal democratic regimes nested inside capitalism. Uh, of course, that goes without saying. But super majorities of ordinary Hungarians and Poles have voted more than once for a, uh, um, a vision of um, the power of a sovereign people that is rooted in exclusion and keeping immigrants out and is actually in both cases uh, to some extent linked with social democratic programs which promise to give better benefits to ordinary working Poles and Hungarians precisely because they exclude foreigners. And this seems to me inarguably a democratic result. In both countries, attempts are being made to strip away liberal protections. So they are illiberal. Um, they are, uh, if you'll pardon the phrase, national socialist. We've been down this path before. And I don't know um, I, I put it out because it, it seems to me it represents a kind of vision that um, for human beings living in the here and now might actually be more appealing than um, what uh, Jacobin's vision is. And my question is what do you do about that? Because uh, when you talk in terms of dictatorship of the proletariat, the abolition of hostile classes, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, this is the language coded of civil war. And, uh, you know, uh, the Paris Commune was the, a byproduct of the civil war. The French Revolution was a civil war. Serious democratic revolutions are civil wars. But I, I don't know where you all stand on this kind of issue because it seems to me it's very painful for people who um, take almost as a, as a form of faith, as I do, as, as Sarah does, that, you know, we're Democrats. This is like, sorry, I, here I stand. And then sometimes I think, oh my God, this is like quicksand. Uh, you know, people change their minds. I have no idea what ordinary people may think at any particular moment. What have I just done? Um, 
Uh, I think we don't need to, you know, refute all of these na nationalist movements, but there's a couple of things I just want to say about them. And one is that they're not like normal nationalist movements. They are ethno-nationalist movements, right? That, and I think there's a difference between that because a sort of theoretical civic nationalism does have space for people who are not, you know, born in Hungary and go back like eight, eight generations. Um, and the second thing is that a lot of their promises are based on like pretty flawed understanding of how economies work and how the global economy works. And so um, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to predict anything anymore, but I do suspect that if you have a totally closed off country um, that's really ethno-nationalist, that doesn't let any new people in, um, I, I think that in the current context it would ultimately fail. Um, and a lot of these guys, Erdogan doesn't believe in inflation. Like, they have, they just don't really get, like, tariffs aren't, say what you will about free trade, but, like, tariffs aren't that good for people or for national economies. And so they don't really understand, or they don't want to understand. it. The, the, the promises are just a way to sell the racism and the xenophobia. Um, so I, I don't think that their socialism is, uh, is legitimate. I do, I do think that there is a way in which the kind of technocratic center in Europe has created the conditions for the rise of the right. So it's done two, in two major ways. One is the rounds of austerity that have hit welfare states in the 70s and 80s and, and, and onward. So in other words, people are making correlations that actually make quite a bit of sense. They're saying that my living standards have declined in the last 20, 30 years, and also like there's more of my neighbors that speak different, different languages. That's that's not a huge leap, you know. That doesn't require. That's that seems like a, a normal correlation. It's our job to to challenge it. And I do agree that in general, um, immigration, which is always going to be managed immigration. In other words, we don't want, or at least I don't want, a borderless world where it, people can just walk in without us knowing who they are. Not because of some Trumpian, oh, they might be criminals, but because simply it's a job of the left to integrate people into welfare states to help them find jobs, to make sure that the people that they're just potentially displacing in labor markets are were then, you know, through active labor market policies, finding ways to, you know, get them into other other fields. And, and also and make sure that they're not forced to move because you've, like, invaded their country or ruined their climate, right? That's, like, the other right. side of that. Yeah. Though I do think there is a place for tariffs. Like, sometimes you want to shelter certain industries. Sometimes you want to expose others to competitive pressure. But, I mean, the bottom line is that I think the technocratic center has created some of this, and people rightly recognize that the ways in which they could assert their democratic popular sovereignty is through the nation state and not through Brussels yeah. in Europe. So Brexit, to me, is perfectly rational. Um, I mean, not in its economic effects will be negative, but European integration to begin with, I think, was a mistake. I think. Countries deserve the right to do things like control their own, well, UK already controls its own central banks, but control its own trade and monetary policies. And, you know, this is where sovereignty is. So I believe in no borders, but not open borders. And I think that's an important distinction. You know, I think once we've heard the word tariff and twice, it's time to turn to the audience to get some tariff? questions. Sure. Uh, because also we're running a little bit out of time. So uh, we have, uh, where is the microphone if people want to ask questions? Um, it, it's sort of drooping back there. Um, I have a question for Basco, though. Yeah. Why, well, do you, why do you accept sovereignty as like a legitimate, I'm, it's an honest yeah. question, I'm not being aggressive. Why do you accept national sovereignty as like a, as legitimate? Well, I accept the de democratic sovereignty with obviously within our rights of framework that protects minority rights, and it just happens to be that this is the level in which there is democracy. Obviously, in theory, I believe in like supranational, you know, and other forms of, of sovereignty and you know in the future. But I think there's an actual contradiction between the two of you, and it was pretty clear, which is I think one of the things that's fruitful about actually looking at what ultimate goals are, because uh, the question of scale is very important for democratic self-government, and that's another um, really intractable tension when you're dealing with uh, things like refugee flows and global warming that seem <coughs> to require a global response, not a national sovereign response. But yes, uh, we're open for questions. If you raise your hand and the microphone will come to you. You'll 
unless there was somebody who wanted to. Um, so I read, I prepared a little bit for, for, um, for today, and so I read some of your very interesting uh, pieces. And I just, I just would like you to, to uh, I just would like you to uh, answer, if you would, where, where is the role of rebellion in your thinking? Because I, I hear a little bit of organizing workers, um, and then on the other hand, you, you know, anyway, there was the word rebellion, and I think Bashkar spoke about mass activity necessary to rock the system. Um, <laughs> and I That's think- That's a terrible sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Atusa, uh, Atusa, I believe it's uh, uh, said incrementalism historically has not worked, and we might have to burn down, burn the whole thing down. So, so where are you on rebellion and instigating revolution? Yeah. I feel like out of context, we sound yeah. pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I, I'll, uh, like, as the New Republic representative, I feel like, that, like this whole conversation is like, um, like this like radical left, and then I'm just sort of like um, representing the the sort of implied centrist. Although, of course, I don't think that's where the New Republic is or should be. Um, but uh, well, I think that there's um, I don't know, rebellion is the word I'd use, and I, I don't even know kind of like you know in what sense like. You're even meaning that, but it's um, it's an interesting it's an interesting sort of uh, institution to be at the helm of the New Republic, which you know is sort of credited widely with you know creating consensus around modern liberalism, um, the very thing that everyone here is you know ready to toss. Um, or not like, well, I don't know. Everyone here is like certainly like uh, cast aspersions on um, in, in various ways. Um, but I think that the thing, yeah, well, I mean, I guess I think the thing that is when I think about, um, and now I'll, I'm just going to plug this, but it's like when I think about the new Republic, um, and what, it, what's interesting to me about it, it, my, my, my references kind of end at 1918. Like I kind of like, it just like st drops off right then. Um, but what, <laughs> But what they were doing was something like very um, audacious and very um, idealistic and very serious-minded to basically take it upon themselves to, uh, you know, redefine the terms of economic of like of of what liberalism could be um, to serve economic needs. Um, social truths and political possibilities. But they were against revolution, so you're deflecting Wait, on, the question. Well, she said rebellion, which is like not revolution. But I, I'm oh. saying that like that there's um, there's something about um, you know the new and the new republic um, is the more interesting word to me of the two. That it's an effort um, to be. There's, when you're chained to that word, you're burdened by what it what it. Um, supposes, um, and it's an effort to be new. It's not a condition. You're not just new. Um, you have to constantly earn that and make yourself new and to, um, what? Oh, yeah, the new school also. A related we're, we're institution. We're really new and we're really old. Um, <laughs> um, but gosh, what I, I kind of almost lost my train of thought. This was going to be a great point. I think I, the thing is this is like, um, the 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 basically where we are now what liberalism was set up to do it's failing at what the democratic party is set up to make possible um it has failed at um here we are and we have um the breakdown of the administrative state we have system failure across the board we have um, mass incarceration i mean i could just go on what what mobilizes everybody here and what's a sort of audacious and interesting, and I would say rebellious project would be to um, to try to actually seize the the terms of the mainstream discourse and remake to like completely reimagine what liberalism needs to be in the twenty first century, what democracy like how that articulates with liberalism, um, and I don't know if that is. 
rebellious, but I guess um, I think that the work of organizing that sounds so, you say it like it sounds so dutiful, but it's actually, um, nothing is more powerful than being in a sea of people that have been organized together um, to demand something that the world's not ready to give them. No, I think we have a question. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, so I'm the tech person, but <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm from China, and so many like most people in China, like China is like the econo economy is growing really fast, and people's life is like improved like in great speed. And actually, most Chinese they don't care about anything about politics because the government is really manipulating people, and people start, start lose their interest of the political pursuit. But people are feeling good themselves. But people here are still criticizing um, the political system of China because it's definitely the opposite of democracy. But my question is, um, do you think democracy itself can be a standard of being good regardless of people's actual feeling of their life? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I would say that I think the democracy is a is a normative goal. Yeah, I think I think it's a good in and of itself. Um, but obviously, state managed liberalism or whatever you want to call it in China has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in the last in the last decades. Um, and I do think, though, it's not. I, I mean, I think the actual depiction of of the situation in China is is in fact a little bit different because China, as it's like in the years where it has the highest growth rates, you'll also see a corollary rise in the number of strikes. You know, like China is, is, is ravaged by massive strike waves. There's tons of discontent with the kind of, um, with people uh, migrating into cities and feeling like locked out of particular labor markets. Like we're only, uh, well, I guess we're a full 30 years away from Tiananmen Square, but I mean, this, this in recent memory is still a country full of upheaval and struggles for democracy. In, in you know, Hong Kong, there was recently the, you know, movements for democratic rights. So, uh, and that and the biggest, you know, workers movement in the world and the biggest strike waves in the world, I think, shows that a country where people are still very political. Um, you might not be able to win a majority now when things are good, but I, I think that, you know, there's, there's still people yearning for something uh, different. I, I want to, uh, I think there are a couple, uh, there's a paradox in China, I was reading in the Financial Times that because Marxism is still mandatory in Chinese higher education, many um, students uh, from uh, the elite have taken on board the idea of workers' power and workers' control, and they have been organizing some of these strikes. So there, I, I'm sure there are more paradoxical turns to come in China uh, uh, because of that. But another piece I read in the Financial Times I think is closer to what you're getting to and it was a very depressing piece that said something like, has a peak liberal resistance passed? Uh, so this is a, an FT uh, columnist and says, what's going to happen if particularly the Democrats don't win either house? And um, he goes on to suggest that in America, will end up with a kind of state-managed administrative oligarchy, not that different from what you have in China, in which many um, liberals who have been in the streets and marching will go home and tend their own garden and will return to private life. And uh, it's a question that you raise about the Chinese that could be raised from time to time about Americans, and it has to do uh, I keep going back to it, is how much do ordinary people really have an appetite for politics and particularly political conflict? We are in a very polarized time. To step up to the plate and um, deal with this political moment, you have to have an appetite for conflict. I deplore all these liberals who say, oh, it's too polarized, blah, blah, blah. No, that's politics. That's the sign we're in an actual politicized moment today with a lot of people out in the streets from both the right and the left. Uh, but how long is that sustainable, particularly when many people, what they want is their big screen TV, which they didn't have 40 years ago in the case of China. I have a daughter-in-law who was born in China. All her Chinese relatives are richer 
than her, Ameri her parents who left China because of Tiananmen Square and came to America. And uh, that's the question mark that seems to me to hang over uh, the social democratic project of the last 200 and, and years. The, and and to, to follow up on that, I don't have the statistics with me. You probably know them uh, better. Maybe they were published in one of your journals. But um, is about how the growing number of young people in America who think a military government would be OK. Yeah. Um, and who are uh, completely uninterested in political participation. That was also partly what I was getting, and I'm to be the cynic, I'm sorry, at the table, um, is like, how are we going to get there when people don't care? They just want their flat screen TVs. And they're happy to let somebody else make decisions if it's going to make them wealthy, uh, if it's going to, or the, that, that promise. Oh, sorry, you have a question. I do. Um, well, I guess I have a question for all of you about how the environmental question affects all of this, because I think the conversation has sort of proceeded under this kind of um, assumption that it's, or the, a lot of the questions are like, well, people, do people really want something better? Do they, they, do, they, do they just want more of the same, really, than, than to sit at home with their big screen TVs? But I think the really the thing about the environmental crisis is that like there will be a different society of some kind. That's not a question. That's the same society. More of the same is not on the table. Yeah. So I'm kind of convinced by the Naomi Klein argument that um, we will have a different society. It'll be uh, a, a society on the terms that exist now, which are authoritarian, and as you hit the limits of of, um, of 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 growth and so on, the state will take more on a role of, of figuring out how to manage increased scarcity and so on, which in inherently leads to more authoritarian tendencies. I think you already see that. Or there's an opportunity to insert, you know, socialist ideas. But I do think that 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 um, for me as a socialist, some of the my old assumptions about what socialism would look like, that it's kind of a pretty simple equation of uh, redistribute power and redistribute wealth, and then you have socialism. I mean, there there is going to be a process, no matter what, of redesigning society, and there will be a new plan that will involve some sort of, uh, of you know, having to make some really scary choices, including choices about democracy and distribution of resources and so on. So I'm interested in how all of you answer this. And I, I'm also interested in challenging a little bit the idea that, that it's, there's a question between more <laughs> whether people want more the same or not. I think that we should not think about it that way. I mean, there is a big choice that will have to be made. It's really a question of whether we're able to insert uh, positive, democratic, socialist ideas into that conversation. So th this follows from the question I asked Baskar, and that's that I think that this climate <laughs> situation is going to cause a total rethink of like what is sovereignty and where are borders and what are borders, right? They're not going to be where we think they are now. They're not going to be what we think they are now. And the sort of model of like one nation state has sovereignty and, and that's that is not going to be the way it is now either. Um, because there will be supranational concerns, planetary concerns, you know, terrestrial concerns. Um, that will be much more pressing. And, you know, you, you already see challenges to, like, what sovereignty is and what it does every day. Um, the other day, a journalist was murdered in the Saudi embassy, and it was this whole charade between, like, the reason it was in the embassy is because embassies are sovereign territory of another country. They're inviolable, which means Turkish police can go in. And so it was this whole charade between Turkish sovereignty and Saudi sovereignty. And I think we're going to see a lot of these situations, right, with Julian Assange at the Ecuadorian embassy, same thing. Edward Snowden in the airport, same thing. We're just going to see a lot of, like, manipulations and, and perversions and um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, anyway, sovereignty is not going to be what we think it is. And I think to like to your point in your work, like mass migration is gonna mass migration would be the context in which we honestly should be talking about all of these things. And you're right that we're not, and that we probably should be, um, and that um, Jim raised this point about uh, fully automated luxury communism, which I think is actually a concept that has declined in popularity <laughs> for <laughs> this exact reason, which is that actually. Um, we don't know what's going to be sustainable. We know that the, you know, you can say that the level of wealth we have now could be redistributed, and we could keep that level of wealth and productivity. But then we're all going to die, as far as we know. Um, I think Kate, you know, we don't have all the answers to this. I think Kate Aronoff is doing some of the very best work on sort of socialist ideas around, which are really, uh, to me, some of the only practical ideas in a way around like 
thinking about the climate crisis and what that means for our politics, I don't know if it's sufficiently integrated into our thinking, but I, you know, one obvious outcome will be mass migration. And so thinking about how our politics involve borders and refugees and so forth, I think is essential. And I do just wanna say that what you said um, about um, climate change leaving us no choice, like we are gonna have a radically new society. I think that's actually true of inequality as well. And so when we have these conversations, the reason that for liberals who maybe previously were not politicized, now they are, maybe they'll go back. It's like, yes, of course, humans vacillate and there will be more and less politically charged moments. But you know, if you looked at Piketty, for example, the inequality is growing and growing to a crisis point. You, there's not gonna be a home to go to that feels safe. I mean, that's why people were so upset about Trump who had not been upset before. They felt safe and then they didn't feel safe anymore. And I think that's gonna continue to drive people into the political realm. And I'm sorry that's not a good enough answer because I think your point is exactly right. So, on the question of leadership and organization, this is where I also push back against Jim, and that I think that democratic centralism has is the only mode of organizing mass parties. So, democratic centralism isn't a Leninist thing; it's actually like the way in which every single mass party has, in some way, organized. And all it essentially means is that. There's freedom of discussion, but broad unity and action around certain things. So the way in which a parliamentary fraction might operate on key votes, like votes of confidence in any parliamentary system, is essentially democratic centralism. The parliamentary fraction votes together, and the minority agrees to vote with the majority, but the minority knows they have certain freedoms and rights, and they could try to win the majority in the future. And I think in general, when we think about how do we organize our meetings on the left and, and things like that? We're sometimes too afraid of hierarchy and bureaucracy and representative democracy because we're aspiring for more direct democracy. But often these things create clear pathways of accountabilities. Oh, this meeting went terribly. This person's mm -hmm. chairing it. Maybe this person shouldn't chair it. Or maybe we should change the structure. And the way in which any system works is if you create a routine system, then you could but you could see variables. You could say, all right, this is the control, this is the way we organize our meetings, this is the structures. Okay, we notice that in this meeting, people of color weren't represented in this way, maybe there's a way to facilitate it so you change the systems, whereas if you go to like an Occupy meeting, like every meeting was different, there was no order, no structure, and it was like the old, um, like Joe uh, Freeman, um, her, her like tyranny of structurelessness, which was, mm -hmm. you know, it was cited constantly around then because it really was addressing a problem. So I think democratic centralism in that broad conception of it is just part of organizing any, any party or any, any movement. I, I should just add that democratic centralism was originally a Menshevik uh, concept that was introduced after the Soviets uh, were formed in 1905. And uh, Lenin uh, uh, paid lip service to it, but actually it has nothing to do with the forms of government that evolved under the Bolsheviks. Oh, the so I have no problem with what you just said. The party from the 1880s onward operated by this, all the parties of the Second International, beginning with the German SPD, operated broadly by democratic centralism. So if anything, you could probably date it to the 1880s, but you probably would date it even before to the first, first international. Mm. But of course, the German SPD, um, Robert Michels looked at it and said, aha, here's an iron law of oligarchy working. So in effect, the answer to her question is, there is no uh, solution to a non-hierarchical, leaderless form of organization. You're left with um, a, a, an oligarchy that is more or less accountable through bureaucratic formal procedures, correct? Uh, well, I mean, the last thing I'll say on this is, is I, 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 think, I think there's a solution to every problem, but we need to experiment things. So, for example, like, I like the idea of having, like, you have some leadership elected by lot, right? You have term limits, you rotate things. These are liberal solutions to, but they're correct liberal solutions. So I think 
in, in the future, like any socialist government or whatnot, we'll experiment with certain structural liberal solutions. We'll experiment with mechanisms to actually get the right people, and we'll, we'll mix getting the right people and getting the right systems and mixing them together. I mean, these are not radical thoughts, but it's the way problems are solved, and political problems are no different than any other problems. Mm -hmm. I want to be in your party. Well, I think that um, something that we like uh, that is often elided or uh, not uh, the distinctions not um, very clearly made in these discussions is where the social is in all of this and what the social has to do with the political. Um, when you talk about a leaderless movement, the the strength and the durability of the social ties in any kind of movement does not depend upon a leader. Doesn't depend upon the formation of a party. It could depend upon all kinds of other things that if we are deliberate and mindful about about what that, those are, you know, what is the role of leadership, what, what is the function of leadership, and what other means can we put in place that would perform that function. To be very deliberate about that is, I think, increasingly important, and that is going to be about sort of social accountability. It is about, you know, running a meeting and having that be not just productive in terms of action items, but producti productive in terms of creating social legibility and sort of uh, the stamina for participating in politics is that it is the fabric of your understanding of yourself, that, that the, the identification of the self with society, and then thus that is politicizing, like that is the way that you keep people engaged. Um, I think regarding migrants, I just was reminded of uh, a really compelling, the way that, that um, Hart and Negri's assembly is organized is like, confusing to me, but one of them was responding to the other one um, about migrants as the kind of like right now, the experience of migrants in the world is um, this amazing, uh, uh, it's, um, it's evidence of the durability of what a democratic sort of future might look like where you, know, you have these populations clashing with one another, you have language, they don't speak the same languages, they are taking on the, the most humiliating work, they're taking on the greatest burden in every society, um, and there is a sort of function of sense-making in that process, there's a function of commoning in that process when you have the migrant experience, um, and you learn new modes of acting together and living together and making decisions together um, that um, I think we can all learn from by paying attention to the work of Atusa, Araxia, Abrahamian, and everybody else here. But I think that also um, that it, it's sort of a, these, this, these early experiences of displacement and really thinking about that as a sort of uh, a starting point for, for democracy in practice um, is useful for think. And maybe just like, I feel, I know for a fact that I cannot answer these questions, <laughs> um, but maybe a, like a small addition would just be, I think it's very hard to say that we can have a plan for um, preventing people from being racist when refugees come over. Um, there is no easy program for that. And I think um, part of the plan always has to be that um, when people come over who are in a vulnerable position, especially as newcomers um, to a country, you protect them. And you protect them until people get over it. Um, and you ensure that new groups of people are able to have political power, um, able to gain political power, are protected in their organizing efforts to represent themselves to no longer be vulnerable, um, and further are you know, given very um, concrete resources to be okay in society. Um, you can't make everyone not racist, but you can feed everybody for sure. Um, and I think it's a job of left institutions in this vein um, to integrate everybody in, into those institutions so unions can be um, racist just like any other institution or you know, it makes no sense to call an institution racist. You can say it's exclusive um, and run by people being racist. Um, but unions can also be um, crucibles of unity, wherein if you are pursuing the same thing and you all hate the same boss, you're going to develop friendships over time. Um, and I think that's the sort of thing that the left 
can offer um, through very practical organizing mechanisms. Um, and I think if we start there, the problem is no less real, but it feels a little less overwhelming than how to get an entire country not to be racist, which <laughs> I, yeah. And I, I wanted to just say one, um, one thing, having been a little bit the contrarian here. Um, again, I think it's from, from your uh, article here. I think one of the things that you do so well and um, can do for, for the left and for, for society and for politics is um, giving these inspir in oh, always sorry. Um, you talk about that the actual conversation has gotten boring, that uh, you know that you, there's a moral deficit, morals deficit, I think, or something like that. The language has become too much about in, in instrumentalism, technocratic, mm. small-minded, and that inspiring, the, just infusing some grand ideas um, is, is, is very important uh, and, and, up, and uplifting. And I, we can ju only hope that this gets out, that you sell lots of copies of your, of your magazine and, and on the internet and, and uh, all of that. So continue the good work. And on that note, I think we should uh, uh, adjourn um, to a reception where there's uh, alcohol and uh, uh, <laughs> a cheese of unknown provenance. And But I want to give a great thanks to uh, the panelists who uh, have joined us tonight for this uh, really lively conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.